Can Gary Dugan save the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise? Stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome to another exciting episode, another edition of Awaken Geekdom here on YouTube. My name is Giovanni Menendez, and today we're going to be talking Omnis, specifically Guardians of the Galaxy Omnibus uh, by Gary Dugan. His uh, run, which wasn't too big, it was only 8, 17 or 18 issues, and it's collected in this very thin Omni that, you know, should, by all means and purposes, should have been a uh, oversized hardcover, in my honest opinion. So yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, let's take a quick look at this omnibus. We take the uh, slip cover off. By the way, this is one of the cooler images. I love the cover for this book. Here we have the back cover. And of course, the wraparound image looking pretty snazzy. If I do say so myself, let's open it up so you guys can see it. If you haven't. Pretty cool with the Milano in the background, all that stuff. So, uh, aside from Spider-Man, which is my favorite superhero, and uh, Fantastic Four, which is one of my favorite teams, and the Inhumans and all that stuff, I really, really, really enjoy uh, Cosmic Marvel. It is rich and, and deep in the history and lore. You can pull out any decade from... Uh, the Fantastic Four days in the 60s and 70s up till now. And yeah, there were some dark uh, blind spots, but for the most part, you will always have a solid cosmic story to fall back on. In my, uh, in my case, of course, it had to be the whole Annihilation, uh, Annihilation Conquest and War of Kings trilogy and all that stuff. That was what got me hooked with Cosmic Marvel itself. I really enjoyed what uh, Abnett and Lanning were doing with those characters. And part of what made it extra special to me was the fact that you rebooted and reintroduced the Guardians of the Galaxy before they were a thing in movies and, and, and uh, cultural awareness and all that stuff. They took C and D listers that nobody cared about, brought them to the forefront, and made something special and awesome to enjoy. Annihilation is one of the best Marvel stories around. I love that story so much. And in there, you saw the uh, uh, reboot, uh, reintroduction of Star-Lord, and then uh, Groot, uh, Rocket, and everybody else started showing up again. So, when that whole saga ended with the Cancerverse and all that stuff, with uh, Thanos Imperative, and then Annihilators, etc., etc., uh, the Guardians were left in a state of limbo until Marvel Now, where uh, Brian Michael Bendis resurrected the team because, hey, there's a movie coming out. This was 2013, 2014. There's a movie coming out about Guardians of the Galaxy. So you might as well bring these characters back to, one, get more readers involved, and two, you know, get new people to enjoy stories about the Guardians. Now, the main problem with the Brian Michael Bendis run, I typically do not have a problem with the writer per se, but what I had issues with is at that time, Marvel had, or you could say they still do, they have this mandate, uh, it was stronger back then, where with Marvel now, you had to imitate the uh, films uh, and the comic books had to reflect that. Especially with a property like Guardians of the Galaxy, you ditched the old clothing and everybody looked like their movie counterparts. Now, I don't really mind uh, because uh, for, for me, I love the designs in the movie. The costume, uh, the costume designs in that movie were great. But I could understand why people would be upset. Now, uh, the run acted too much like uh, a new reader-friendly story and resurrecting all these characters that some were gone, others were missing, and suddenly Bendis just brings them back out of nowhere uh, and uh, he breathes a new characterization in them that was a little bit weird compared to what Abnett and Lanning uh, had done with the previous stories. It, it didn't really match. And that has been the constant 
A problem that I've had with Guardians of the Galaxy ever since Marvel Now, you had uh, the all-new different era and the uh, legacy and whatnot. I, I don't know, it's a lot of reboots. So now it is uh, Dugan's turn to reboot, I guess, or, or take the ship into his own hands and, and try to create something interesting. And for the most part, in my honest opinion, Dugan does a fantastic job of not only bringing in new readers with a contemporary mix of old, classic, and new, but at the same time, crafting a story that will appeal to old school comic book cosmic fans. Yeah, uh, there is a lot of elements, especially in the first issue, which I think was a free comic book day thing, where it's only, it's half an issue, I don't know uh, the page count, but it's like half an issue and it's this very bare bones, cliche, kind of cringe worthy introduction to who these guys are with the whole music thing, imitating uh, Chris Pratt's delivery in the movie and all that stuff. I found it really cringy and I actually kind of questioned what I was reading. It wasn't until I got to the actual first issue where uh, Dugan has the ability to flesh things out a little bit more. I do know that there was a two, um, it was a, a two issue per month thing or something, and he had to get uh, some help because there is a ton of people working in this book. Gary Dugan, Aaron Cooter, Marcos Toe, Evie, Eves for Cena. I'm butchering that horribly, I'm sorry. Uh, Ian Herring with art uh, from Fraser Irving, Chris Samney, Greg Smallwood, Mike Hawthorne, Terry Pallet, Roland Boshi, uh, Bosch, uh, Rob Reyes, Matthew Wilson, Jordi Belair, and Dan Brown. I'm not making that up. Look at that. Almost all that paragraph is just listing names. There is a ton of people working on this book. Some stuff I do like, others not so much. There, the, I'll just get the negatives out of the way first. There is this tendency in the book, like when the story's getting good, I think it's because they couldn't keep up with the scheduling thing and they stuck in an issue where it's a completely different artist and the plot is different, the, the writing is different. Like you'll have this story about uh, this modern version of the Guardians and then uh, they are trying to get a very rare item for a cosmic being and it's pretty cool. I'm not going to spoil it just in case, I'm just going to give you the bare bones necessities of this book. And then it switches to a standalone issue regarding Star-Lord coming back to Earth uh, or back in time or something to record a special song for his mixtape. That's it. And then after it's done, we go back to the regular story. I don't mind those type of stories, but uh, like when you're reading a manga or you're watching an anime, for example, you would leave that after a big story had finished, a big story arc, uh, usually about uh, episodes 13 or 26 or something like that. You know, for my anime peeps, you probably know what I'm talking about. The book just crams the issue right in and it's, it's a heavy uh, cringe to read something that does not have to do with the awesome uh, story that you were reading about this uh, heist that the, the Guardians are trying to pull off for this special character that is requesting an item. So when the story resumes, we get more of that with another artistic change. Then later on, there's another story that involves Gamora, and that is actually one of the subplots, I guess, or the, actually the main plot of the book. And it's fine, but the contrast is so big from Pooter and Toe to suddenly go to somebody like uh, uh, Fraser Irving, it's a drastic change. Then you get another issue from Rot Race, which uh, honestly looked like uh, Phil Noto-esque, and it just throws you off because I'm like, ooh, okay, that looks really like uh, Phil's artwork. I want more of that, but then no, it switches to a lighter uh, color palette, uh, judging from uh, the cover image and like, seriously, look at all this yellow. Look at all the bright colors. I love this, by the way. This dark, somber gray and, and green. Uh, yeah, it, it's a little bit jarring when you have artwork like this, which is phenomenal, it's spectacular. I'm a huge fan of the artist. But then you read stuff following issues, you read stuff like this, which is super uh, more animated, cartoony, and vibrant. 
uh, that I think could put some people off. Now, the actual plot, Gary does a good job of balancing uh, the humor. Sometimes it's a little bit too much, other times it's fine. But for the most part, he captures the essence and the attitude and bravado and, and just the ragtag uh, ensemble that uh, DNA did back in the day. But mixes it, of course, with contemporary uh, takes on uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy and the movie versions. And that's perfectly okay. I completely understand. You have a juggernaut of financial success with those Guardians movies. You want to capitalize on... Uh, those characters and do everything imaginable to uh, get new readers that want to familiarize themselves with uh, what they saw on their TV screens or movie theaters or whatever. But overall, uh, the Guardians book is fun. I can understand why people would be bored, especially if they're fans of old school Guardians and they don't want to see the movie versions translated with hokey jokes and cringy interactions with each other and all that stuff that is completely understandable but i do have to agree that uh the tonal shifts are a deterrent for this book like you have that plot with the guardians to assist with a theft of a special item and then you have a subplot involving gamora and then you have another subplot involving uh, Drax, who's now a, a pacifist, and you have another subplot regarding uh, Groot himself, which is pretty integral to everything. It's a multi-layered story that I really appreciated. It brings the gang back together. It's fun nonetheless. Actually, now that I think about it, the greatest highlight of this book would probably have to be the later portions with the reintroduction of a certain costume hero that I love. If you're a fan of cosmic uh, stories, this is the book for you because you will appreciate the return of a certain character. Also, the return of the Nova Corps. Nova Corps are back. They were dismantled, dismembered, dis whatever. And I do appreciate Dugan's ability to get back to uh, the older stories that uh, Abnett and Lanning were doing and bring them back and continue that plot. The aftermath of the Cancerverse story, uh, the aftermath of Annihilation Conquest, all that stuff still comes to play in this book. And that, to me, is the selling point. That is what I would recommend to people. If you, wanna, if you want a good continuation of that era, this is probably the story for you. But whatever. Uh, it's a solid, fun romp with uh, lovable characters that either you love from the movies or you've read previous stories with them. Dugan, again, is able to mix and match uh, different uh, voices and it he comes out with his own take. It takes a little bit of everybody and produces his own flair and gusto that I think old school Marvel fans will enjoy for the most part and new fans will eat it up and really freaking enjoy it. As for the art, tonal inconsistencies like I mentioned. I was not a fan of so many artistic changes, but for the most part it looks solid. I wanted the whole book to be bright and colorful because that's my preferred palette uh, choice for a lot of these books, but uh, what we do get is pretty cool and uh, the filler artists do a good job even though the stories get in the way of the larger uh, narrative. Now, I should mention, if you're getting this book, please be aware that it ends on a big cliffhanger and it continues into the Infinity Countdown storyline. I don't know why they couldn't include those eight or nine issues or something like that into this and make like the real... Uh, Dugan Cosmic Omnibus, if you will, but whatever. So you you're gonna have to get the uh, this Thin Omni and the Infinity Countdown trade paperback. So yeah, I won't do a review on Infinity Countdown, but if you guys want me to do one, uh, add it to the queue list, I guess. Uh, yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy by Gary Dugan, an exercise of creative thinking and how to maximize your potential with different variants and how to get the best results. That's what I would say about this run. Also, uh, I would do want to show you guys inside the flap. I'm not going to go to the actual image, but this is some of the uh, stuff that you can find. Here you have Rocket, Groot, and a special guest as Nova Corps members. 
yeah, it gets crazy and pretty cool. I, I really enjoyed it. I also liked what they did with uh, Gamora and her uh, soul searching and other characters as well, trying to find their footing in a vastly different post-Secret Wars world. So yeah, what do you guys think? Did you like Gary Dugan's run uh, or Gary Dugan's work on Guardians of the Galaxy? Let me know down below. I'm very interested in hearing or reading some of those opinions. Guys, as always, thank you once again for liking, commenting, subscribing, and following me here at A Week in Geekdom on YouTube. You can also follow me on your favorite social media platform, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. By the way, I am going to show you the uh, magic statue. This has nothing to do with Guardians of the Galaxy, but I did get a request on the previous video to show you uh, the statue, which is all kinds of awesome. So yeah, stay tuned after the credits. I will catch all of you on our next episode.